and give a big holler to Jen Dulski and Perry Gorman. <laughs> Um, this would be an excellent moment to silence your cell phones. Thank you. Um, super happy to have you here, Jen. And um, I, I always love these opportunities to uh, to interview interesting people. But I think you know I feel like we have so much in residence that I am particularly excited about interviewing you. Um, I mentioned a little bit about how we like to format, and I'd love to get started by talking about how you got started in your career and kind of like your, your earlier days of um, like what drives you and, and what your interests are. Yep, sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I don't always get a standing ovation at the beginning of my talk, so that was awesome. Um, so let's see, I'll start a little bit earlier than my career because I think I have a core belief that people are who they are because of the experiences they have throughout their lives, including when they're young and sort of the things that shape us. And I was very lucky. I actually grew up in the city of San Francisco, um, which is pretty unusual, although I moved when I was four, so the real natives don't count me. Uh, and I had, uh, I had two parents that were great role models. So I had a father who kind of believed that girls could do anything and told us we could do anything and gave me little tips like, Never apologize at the beginning of a sentence when you're telling someone a new idea, which you'd be shocked how many people still do that. Uh, and I had a mother who worked full time and had what I call grit. She changed careers midlife and went to business school at night with two kids and then interviewed for 50 jobs before she got one and ended up becoming a really successful consulting partner uh, at a big firm. So I had great role models. And in my early career, I have sort of an unusual early start to an entrepreneur's career, which is that I founded and ran a nonprofit, and I was a high school teacher right out of school. So a little bit different of start, although in a lot of ways, starting a nonprofit is very much like starting a company. And I raised a million dollars for this fledgling nonprofit in its first couple years, which was not that different from raising money for a startup. I don't usually, um, I don't, as a woman, I don't usually ask questions about being a woman, but you, I read something that you mentioned um, that you had an early mentor uh, that was a woman. And could, in addition to the story about your mother that you just mentioned, how much did that impact your success today? Yeah. So it's interesting, I get asked a lot of questions about what it's like to be a woman in leadership and a woman in technology, and I generally believe people in all their different experiences and backgrounds have a lot to add, and what makes us each unique gives us value to add, and me being a woman gives me value, me be growing up in San Francisco has value, me, you know, the other thing that's interesting about me is I'm only five feet tall. There are actually fewer CEOs shorter than five foot seven than there are female CEOs. <laughs> so, <laughs> two crazy. things. Um, but I learned at an early age that it's all about what you believe inside and how confident you are in yourself, and that finding those mentors and people who believe in you and who give you the runway to, to try new things is what matters. And when I was in high school, I started uh, coxing a men's crew team. Does everyone know what a crew is? Yeah. Uh, and the coxswain in the boat is sort of like a coach. And this was, I think, one of my most formative leadership experiences because I had to earn respect of eight people who were working as hard as they possibly could when I was sitting in the boat giving them constructive feedback and, <laughs> um, and making them want to win, even though they were in the most pain they'd ever been in, in their lives. God, that and sounds like a startup. It does, it does. It turns out it's quite relevant in a lot of life. <laughs> Uh, and I also worked with a group of men, and many, many times in my career, I've been the only woman amongst a group of men. So I had an early experience which sort of trained me that it just doesn't matter that you, I think my mic went off, uh, that you earn respect by building strong relationships with people, by believing in them, and by setting high expectations for people. And the mentor that you mentioned, um, yeah, when I ran my nonprofit, it was uh, in the early 90s, sort of at the very dawn of the internet. And I worked in a school, and we had internet access. We weren't wired for the internet, if you remember that. 
Um, and I had a woman on my board who was very tech savvy, and which was unusual in those, those days. And she said, I said, I have access to the internet. You know, what, what is this thing and how do I use it? And she said, there's these two guys at Stanford and they've started this site called Yahoo. And she wrote it for me on a post-it note and stuck it to my computer. And from that day on, I just fell in love with the internet. And I knew, I could see the potential and the power and she was the one who sort of gave me the confidence to take that path. So take us through the transition from you realizing that, I guess this goes back to the idea that you wanted to do something scalable, yeah. right? Um, so the, the transition between having your nonprofit, getting to a point where you're like, okay, I can only do so much as one human being, yeah. and I can only touch so many people's lives, to how did you actually get into Yahoo from there? Yeah. So um, you're right, what was happening is we, I was running this very successful nonprofit. It was preparing middle school students to be the first in their families to go to college. And I could see that it was working. I mean, there were, I would get notes from these kids' parents that would say things like, you know, it's a sink or swim world and you're teaching my son how to swim. And I would literally cry seeing these letters. It was so amazing. But at the same time, I could only, I could just only serve so many children. You know, we. I had raised quite a bit of money and we could take 100 kids a year. And I knew it was making a difference for those 100 kids, but I felt like there had to be something more and there had to be a way to do this at scale. And that's what I believed was the promise of the internet. And I fell in love with Yahoo in those early days and I basically found my way out to Yahoo and got a job. Uh, I went to business school in between and then I got my MBA internship at Yahoo. I was one of the first two MBA interns there when Yahoo was 400 people. And I had to get a grant, actually, because they didn't pay <laughs> very well at the time. Um, and what's interesting is it's come full circle now because in those early years, I think that was the promise of the internet, that it could, it was scalable, it was infinitely scalable, globally scalable, and you could reach anybody and really change people's lives. And that is what's happened, um, but it's taken some slow steps. So you first saw sort of information, and then you saw commerce, and then you saw community and social media. And what we're seeing now at change.org is that this idea of impact at scale is finally possible. And that's what makes my current job so exciting. So before we get to your current job, we there's a kind of an, an interesting story as well in the middle, which is uh, DealMap, right? And uh, that it got acquired by Yahoo. But there was, you were brought in to basically pivot the company and, 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 <laughs> yeah, and, and, and fix it. Um, tell us a little bit about what that experience is like, because it was already funded and you came in and it was a mess and, or maybe not, I mean, we shouldn't say that. Um, say maybe you, you came in and had to fix it. Yeah, so DealMap was a really interesting and formative experience for me. When I got there, it was actually called Fat Door. We changed not only the product, but the name of the company three times. So I have been in the depths of the startup experience and I often refer to myself as just too stubborn to fail. Like that company basically could have failed multiple times along the way if we had just decided to stop working on it because, yeah. And before you even get to that, how did you get there? Like how did, how did, they, how did you get into that position? Yeah, I was recruited by an executive search firm okay. because they were looking for a new CEO. They had funding, as you said, and they had you know, the start of a product idea and a brilliant CTO who is still a very dear friend of mine and a small team and they wanted someone to kind of help them figure out what to do with the company. Okay. Uh, so okay. I came in and it was, as you've interviewed other founders here, it was, I started at the end of 2007, which was sort of right before the nuclear winter of venture capital <laughs> and the whole economy crashed and we didn't yet have a great idea and we had a saying we used to use, must be present to win that we just, we had to make it through with the cash we had until we found an idea that was working enough um, that we could either, that we could raise more money. And that was what we were trying to do. And, you know, some lessons I learned there. One is how to tell the difference between something that's working and not working. It's hard to, t it's harder than you think to tell. And we launched our second product. It was called Centered. It was a sentiment analysis based local search engine. And the idea was that 
it would be like Zagat, except algorithmically, without the people having to do it. And we analyzed 40 million reviews and pulled the content out and structured the data, and it was great content. You know, people could tell, we could tell you what was a kid-friendly restaurant or what was a group-friendly place to go in an instant with bar charts and so forth. And people liked it. They just didn't need it. And so they, the only people who needed it, actually, as it turns out, were local publishers. So we ended up with a licensing business to large local publishers who needed content. And that was an OK business. It just wasn't a great business. And so we pivoted one more time until we started DealMap. And as soon as we launched it, it took off like a rocket ship. And so it was only at that moment that I really realized that what we were doing before didn't work. Because all of a sudden, this thing worked so well, it was like a light bulb. And there are little signs, like we would get emails, cold emails, into us as this tiny startup from senior execs at MasterCard, and Microsoft, and other places wanting to work with us without us reaching out. That is a sign that it was working. So look for those. Um. What kind of, this is a good place to give some entrepreneurial advice. Um, and, and you've also written about the struggle mm -hmm. as, as actually being the juice yeah. of the journey. Um, what advice would you give to people who are working on startups, particularly early stage startups, where you know, it's the do you keep going? Because yeah, yes, it may not be that it's gonna work, but when, when do you quit, when do you pivot? When do you know to keep going? It's a great question. I think the, for me, the way I describe entrepreneurship is it's like climbing a mountain. And I said, some days felt amazing. It was a sunny day. I was halfway up the mountain. I brought my picnic lunch. I could see the top. Like, we were going to win. And other days felt like it was you know, the biggest storm I'd ever seen. I was at the way bottom. My backpack weighed like 50 times my body weight. And I just, you know, your competitor launches something or something, you know, your site goes down or whatever it may be. And great entrepreneurs are the people who keep going up. Both days, you have to keep climbing. And the really even good Even on ones, the good days. Even on the good days. I've heard someone say that's that right. too, like, you know, when it's good, it, like, that's where your discipline comes in. It's actually that's right. when, it, when it's good. That's right. And, the, you know, the really, really good um, entrepreneurs not only keep climbing themselves, but they get their teams to come with them, right? Because great companies are built by teams of great people. And so, you know, what you want is to be an inspirational leader who even on the darkest days and on the good days can encourage people to come with you. Um, how to know when to pivot is a different question. And I think, um, again, <laughs> I forgot who said this. I think it was Jeff Parker. That, um, you know, great businesses are when people are willing to pay you for something that you make, that they need. And so there are, um, there are lots of businesses these days that start without any revenue at all, which is fine. But at the very least, you want to make sure you're making something people need. Even if they don't pay you at the beginning, they have to need it, they have to want it, and they have to use it a lot. Um, and that's the key. So if that's how I knew, for instance, to pivot from centered to deal map, is that we didn't have enough of a market that needed, desperately wanted our product. When I think about a change, we use lots of products from startups, right? We use Stripe and we use Optimizely and all these other startups' products because we need them and they help us. And so you sh if, when you start a business, you want to be in that position. So acquisition is something a lot of people get very excited about, you know, particularly when it's by a company like Google. Um, how did that come about? And you know, just tell us some of the highlights of that story for you. Sure. So we were in a very lucky spot that um, we were, had just the right product in the right place at the right time, we, were, we had become basically the largest local deals aggregator. And so everybody who wanted local deals content at that time got it from us. And everyone who had local deals gave us their content because they wanted distribution. And it was, it was like a little bit like those early days at Yahoo, which when we used to say the fish were jumping in the boat, like you were just sitting there and people would call us every day asking to work with us. Um, but we had, so we were lucky to have the choice to, between raising more money and selling the company. We 
had a term sheet for more funding, and we had a, a couple offers uh, to buy the company. And it was a challenging decision. I, this was one where you know, we sp spent a lot of time thinking about it. Our board didn't all see things the same way. So it was quite a challenging situation to navigate. And to me, what it came down to was two things. One, we wanted to do that business at scale, right? And when Google in particular came to us, we felt like this was the opportunity to take what we had built and get it out instantly to hundreds of millions and billions, potentially, of people, um, which was very appealing. Uh, the other thing is, and this was great advice uh, that came to me from a colleague of mine who used to work in corporate development uh, at one of the big companies, and he said, Jen, everything has a window. And, you know, if you think about it, when YouTube was bought, everybody wanted to buy a video company. And there are these sort of rolling times when certain things will be very popular. And it turns out that local deals, that was our window. And he said, you've got to know, know your window, look for your window. And if it's your window, it's better to act now than to wait because you don't know what will happen. That's brilliant. And as it turns out, and I think I had some understanding of where the ecosystem might go, it turned, it turned out to be very good timing, both for us and for Google. And in fact, my whole team is still at Google and quite happy and you know, working on the offers team at Google. And it powers all the offers in, in Google Maps. And you know, it's great to see our technology seeing so many people use it. So before we came on, I was saying to Jen um, how there are a lot of stories that are a little bit like the Odyssey journey, where you kind of start in one place and come full circle, uh, but you are different. And I feel like your story is so much of that because you ended up at change.org after the journey of nonprofit and going through Yahoo and Google and learning about being an entrepreneur and raising money and selling a company, et cetera, to now be able to take all of that and apply it to what you truly are passionate about, um, and you were brought on to scale change. So tell us a little bit about your vision and like how you ended up there and, and what you see for, for the company going forward. I think you described it better than I could. It is, um, it is like a dream job to me. It's both of my passions coming together. One is to really impact the world and the other is to scale big internet companies. Uh, and the chance to put those two together was really something I couldn't pass up. Uh, we have amazing momentum as a company. So we have 45 million people around the world already using our product. We're winning victories every single day. We literally win 10 to 20 victories a day now around the world. And for us, a victory is not just getting a certain number of signatures on a petition, but actually when the decision maker who that petition is targeting agrees to do the thing that the petition is asking for. And you're getting 20 plus a day of those 20 a day of those actual kind of victories. changes. You should see it. I have this map that shows where we have victories in a given month around the world. That's fabulous. And they're literally everywhere. We've had victories on every continent, including Antarctica at this point. Um, so it is, it's just an incredible amount of momentum. And that comes with its challenges, right? So, you know, my so what job. What are those? Yeah, well, my job is to think about how to build the, a team that's, you know, growing. We have an amazing team now, several people in the audience on the team. And, um, and so I need to scale that team out larger. We're hiring. And we need to build a technology platform that scales globally. We have staff in 18 countries, but people in every country on the planet use our product. And it's the kind of product that is our content is very powerful and often very viral. So we have the kind of traffic that really spikes in certain parts of the world at different times, and we need to prepare for that. We're doing lots of things in deep data science, thinking about how to get relevant content to the right people. I'd like to actually stop you there, because that's a very interesting point. And this is also something Jen and I did a, a pre-call for this. And one of the things we were talking about is uh, the impact of technology on humanity. and the, the line there and how you marry the two together and and why you guys why you think you've had success yeah. and, and if you want to 
That's right. So we've actually been looking a lot at this. Like, what is it that works? And it works so well that literally when we turn it on in any given country, it just sort of has a life of its own and it takes off. And for us, we think, we believe that the special sauce is really this powerful combination of compelling personal stories and the technology to help it scale. And we've looked at examples where you have one without the other and they just are not as effective. And so, you know, people who start petitions on change, they really have compelling stories and they're not afraid to tell them. So we have people like, you know, Lakshmi Agarwal, for instance, who is a young woman in India who was attacked by having acid thrown on her, which has become an increasingly common crime in India. One out of every thousand girls is suffering from this crime. And she has, you know, it's her personal story. It took her eight years, but she built up the courage to start a petition on change. And she had 28,000 signatures in just four days on her petition. And then she took this petition to the Home Minister of India. And they have agreed to regulate the sale of acid in India to make it much harder for people to buy and therefore harder for people to commit the crime. And again, if we had said, if someone had started a petition just saying regulate the sale of, of acid in India and tried to share it with people, the technology would be there, but the story that connects people, that inspires them to act, wouldn't be there and it wouldn't be as powerful. And the same thing is true. We've got many, many examples of people on our site who who've been fighting the same issue for years, and it's only after starting a petition and having an easy way to mobilize others online that they're successful. So there are a couple of things there, I think, that are very interesting. And one is, is, is the access, which obviously comes with the scale, right? So how do you get the message out to all these people around the world in these situations? And some of them are not, they're not necessarily, like, in, in the same position as we are in this room, how did someone like Lakshmi find out about change.org and, and that it's even accessible to yeah. her? So we have, you know, we are a global empowerment platform, so you are absolutely right that our goal is to give power to people who don't think they have it, never thought they could, and the way that we get the word out to those people is actually by spreading the stories of the people who come before them. So because the stories are so compelling, we actually get a huge amount of press coverage. In fact, I looked at it last quarter, we were in the press an average of 250 times a day oh my God. around the world. That's fabulous. So people see these stories, and it's, it's their local paper. It's everything from a local paper to Good Morning America and The Ellen Show and CNN and The New York Times. And they hear the stories of someone who's come before them who might be someone who looks just like them. It might be a young person, or it might be a person who, again, doesn't come from you know, a, back, a wealthy background. And if they, they say to themselves, well, if she could do it, I could do it. And we, we literally have stories of people who say, I started this petition because I saw this other person win. On they were the inspired. Mm -hmm. And then um, you mentioned that a good portion of the people that start petitions are very young. And where the impact of that is and, and how they, they can't believe, uh, they, don't, they don't believe yet that they can't do it. Right. It is, it's so interesting. And I think this is true of entrepreneurs as well. We do, we see a lot of young people start and win petitions on change.org. And I think part of it is that. They, don't, they just don't know they can't, right? Like when I was 21 and I moved to a new city to start this nonprofit, I didn't think there was any reason I couldn't do that, so I went ahead and did it. And I think that's, you know, the, the best entrepreneurs also feel that way. Um, the petition starters on our site, it's just so interesting. There's, there's a young girl named Sarah Kavanaugh, and you guys might have heard this story. She is an athlete. She was drinking Gatorade one day. She's a high school student. She was 15 at the time. And she looked at the ingredients on her Gatorade bottle, and one of them was brominated vegetable oil. And she looked it up and found that it was outlawed in Japan and Europe, but still allowed in the US, and actually is a flame retardant. And so she petitioned Gatorade to take out BVO from their products. And she had hundreds of thousands of people sign her petition. And she ended up on tour with Dr. Oz and also on the Today Show. And when she was in the green room for one of these shows, 
there was a gentleman there from the Center for Science and the Public Interest, and he said, you know, I've been fighting this for 10 years, wow. trying to get this ingredient, you know, watched by people, and in six months, a 15-year-old girl was able to do what we've been trying to do for a decade. And so it just shows the power, again, of, of people who believe in themselves and have a technology platform like ours to take action on and make it easy to mobilize the people who believe in them. And the impact that that will have on her life, that she was able to do that. That's right. Well, I'm she sure started she's another one be, yeah, <laughs> right after right, that. Yeah. Um, in terms of, uh, like, what's next for change.org? Like, what, what's, like, how can, how, how was it, will it affect people in this room? And, like, what would you like people to know about change.org if, if, you know, you have that platform right now? So, there's a couple things that are, are coming that we think are really exciting. The first is that we believe we are, are the first of several in a an increasing number of businesses for social good. So we are firmly in the camp of believing that you can do good in the world and do well as a company and use revenue to scale the impact you drive. And we're doing that every day. And we hope that our model, that other people will be able to follow this model and use it. For us as a company, uh, you know, our vision is to create a world where no one is powerless and change is part of everyday life. So we want everyone out there to believe that they can change anything they want to change. And we have a new product we're getting ready to launch uh, just quite soon, this month, uh, called Change.org for Decision Makers that will give, because we believe it's a two-way dialogue. It's not just someone asking for something. They are actually proposing a potential solution to someone who has the power to make a decision about that thing. And we're creating this new product that will give a voice to decision makers. We'll start with elected officials and then expand it to, to more decision makers and create this two-way dialogue. And so that's, the, it will become an increasingly important part of every company and every official's life to talk to the people who are their constituents and their fans directly, and we intend to be a key part in making that happen. Good timing on yeah. that. <laughs> would be nice. If, on yeah. that product. Um, what are some of the most touching stories, like the, like the one that first comes to mind that, that just like touches your heart? So we have a lot of touching stories, and what's interesting, we actually, we map the causes also that people start petitions on, and it's literally every cause under the sun. So anything people are passionate about, we see petitions on them. For me, the ones that touch me personally generally have to do with children or education. I'm also a mom, I have two daughters, and I was a teacher, so things in that arena I find particularly touching. And there's a story from earlier this year, uh, a young 10-year-old girl named Sarah Murnahan who was dying of cystic fibrosis and needed a lung transplant. And the way that our organ donation policy works in this country, it says that uh, for lung transplants, children can only receive lungs from other children. Even if they're sicker than every adult on the list, they have to wait until the adults turn it down. And that basically meant that she was sentenced to die. Um, because, and she was old enough, she was 10 years old, that her body could accept an adult lung. And so her mother started a petition on change, and um, after several different tries, was ultimately successful at getting a judge to um, put a ruling in place that allowed Sarah to get a lung transplant, and actually one other young boy too, who, who, and both of these children are still alive today because of it. And now they are reviewing the organ donation policy in general. So it's very likely to cause not only you know, saving the life of these two young kids, but systemic change in the policy so that kids in general will be able to, you know, to benefit from it. And for me, that was particularly touching because I have a daughter that same age, and it just makes you realize, you know, these stories are about real people's lives, and all of us, by signing these petitions, have the impact, have the potential to impact this kind of change. I want to tie it back to the entrepreneurial journey and how important it is for people to work on things. I mean, people do startups for a lot of different reasons. And, and how important is it to, you know, pick something that's really in your, in your wheelhouse? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of great ideas out there for startups, and that's what one of the wonderful things about being an entrepreneur is you can invent anything you can think of. And again, the key is making sure it's something people need and will use. Um, I, I think our belief is that more and more um, doing good in the world will become important to the success of companies. So I would definitely encourage more people to think about how to build businesses that also make the world better. It's really possible to do that. If you had advice on like two things that a new entrepreneur could do to tee up their company to deal with that or to think about that, what, what yeah. two tips so would you give? The first one is to is to sort of make a commitment to yourself to put your mission first. And you know, we've done that as by be becoming certified as a B Corp or a benefit corp where we've committed that our mission is first. And we generate revenue, but we generate revenue in order to drive impact. And it means that we've done things like commit not to go public or sell the company so that we can always put that mission first and we don't get sucked into things you might have to do just to turn a short-term profit or please a, a certain um, investor or flip your company for sale. Um, that's the first thing. And the second thing that is just what I advise all entrepreneurs in general, which is just keep at it. Like it's not necessarily specific to social good businesses, but it is really critical for being a successful entrepreneur. There's, and honestly, critical for being in a, in any job at most companies. You know, our company is getting larger. We have 170 people now, and we still have tough days climbing the mountain. And when I worked at Google and it was nearly 50,000 people, you know, we had tough days also. Um, but really for entrepreneurs to think about what it is that motivates you and, and having, it may be a particular passion or, or area you want to go into, but I think having that, for us, having that mission really helps on those challenging days and on the good days because you know you're doing it for a reason and what you do matters. I think, I think I'm going to close it there. I think that's a good place to tie it up. I want to leave a little bit of time for people to ask questions. Um, I, where's Carly? Do you want to help me with that since we're probably going to need the microphone run? Does anyone have questions for Jen? Great, hang on one second, we're gonna get you a mic. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned that great companies are built by great teams. I was wondering if you could speak more about that and how do you build great teams yes. around yourself? I love that question. This is actually my favorite thing to do and I probably spend half my time hiring people now. <laughs> I'm constantly interviewing people. Um, and I, I, I wrote a post, a whole post about this on LinkedIn if anyone wants to read it. Uh, but for me, one of the things that I look for are people who are driven from within. Um, and the way that I usually see that in people is that they have patterns of accomplishment throughout their life. So, and it can be anything. Like we literally just hired someone uh, who's starting quite soon who said, you know, I was in sixth grade, I was the first you know, crossing guard or something to ever be accepted that young. And when I was in high school, I was the first 11th grade editor of the yearbook. And I was like, yes, that's the person I want to hire. Because it doesn't really matter. The truth is she was motivated as a kid to do things, to excel in those things. And it means she's going to be motivated also when she comes to work for us, whatever it is. Um, and so that is the, literally the number one thing I look for when I hire people. And it might be, you know, for instance, the kids I used to teach at Breakthrough that were the first in their families to go to college, that was a heck of an accomplishment. You know, they had, they had to work really hard to get there, and so I would hire people like that all day long. Two questions. One is, uh, what is the number of, uh, you know, people that sign a petition that, you know, makes the decision maker to actually make the decision? Mm -hmm. That's one question. Yeah. And the other one is, what is your conversion rate? I mean, people, you know, may, oh, I want to, I want to, the first time that I receive an email from, you know, change.org, yeah. they, it came my, my address, I'm from Mexico, okay? 
<laughs> and it was like a politic kind of uh, petition. He came my address, my name, and everything, and say, oh man, no, I, I gonna go back because I didn't know anything about change at all, so. Huh. So the first question is how many signatures do you need to win? And the really amazing thing is that when we look at all the victories that happen every month, um, some of them win with a huge number of signatures, of course. Like, you know, for instance, one of our largest was the petition started by Trayvon Martin's parents to prosecute George Zimmerman, and that had 2.2 million signatures on it. So we do get some very large petitions. But the majority of petitions, if you look at a, you know, a bar chart of winning, winning petitions, the majority win with about 100 signatures. So you really don't need a ton of signatures to win. A lot of these petitions target you know, smaller or more local issues. And what happens is people want to avoid a huge eruption of complaints. You know, there, this is an easy way to listen to your constituents. So people might say, I, need a, I would really like a new street light on my street. And after 100 people sign it, they can say, oh, if I don't do something about this, it's going to get bigger, and then it's going to be in the media, and it will become a problem when instead, by responding, it can be a win-win. I can say, great, we're going to do this thing, and then I appear and am a responsive decision maker. So there's actually quite a lot of petitions that win with not very many signatures. Um, in terms of, I'm not going to talk specifically about conversion rates, but I think um, if your question was about getting email from us, is that the question? No, no, it's more about you know, when people receive an email, how many people actually sign? Yeah, we have quite effective email. So I will use some of the stats that we use with organizations who partner with us. And on average, we have about three times the industry average open rates on our email and at least two times the industry average action rates on our email. And we do a lot of work to make sure that our emails are really relevant and targeted at folks um, so that they, you know, they're about causes they care about. Um, I'd be interested to know what you do, if you do anything with the data that you collect um, regarding issues and, and just different parts of the world and things like yeah. that. Yeah. So today, what we mainly do with the data we collect is, again, make sure we use it to give back content that's really relevant to people who are taking action on it um, because we want to make sure we have the largest base of active action takers in the world, and we want to make sure that we keep those people inspired and taking action. So that's the bulk of what we do with the data. Um, we will soon be using it to do things like send you petitions that are local to you and other things like that. Hi. Um, I really respect your experience in both the nonprofit and for-profit industries. So I'm curious if you think there's a distinction between nonprofits that have a sustainable business model and impact-driven for-profits, and why that distinction, if there is, is that distinction needed and for what purpose? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think there's, so if we take just nonprofits and, and businesses or social good businesses, there is a pretty big difference, which is that most nonprofits have a harder time building self-sustaining revenue, that they have to keep fundraising over and over again from foundations, from individuals, and it can be challenging to scale. There are obviously good examples, and lots of our you know, partners and so forth are, are big, scalable examples. For nonprofits that have um, sustainable business models, I think one of the key differences has to do with hiring and retaining talent. So for us, being a business, allows us to do things like pay talent market rate salaries, which is really important if we want to hire the best people, which we do. So that, to me, is one of the big differences. Can I yeah, up on that sure. Is there a need for nonprofits that sustainable business models that they can do that? That is a big question. There is, there certainly is, and uh, the person who answers this better than me is a woman named Lila Jana, who runs Samasource. And I heard her give the greatest answer to this question, and now I can't remember what she said. <laughs> but it made such a lot of sense. And how about I will write a post about this on LinkedIn when I go find her answer. What are some of the most novel petitions you've had? 
Yeah. So we get, we get petitions on just about everything you can imagine. And of course, a lot of them are these really touching, heartwarming stories. Um, but we get lots of pop culture petitions too. So you may have seen the one that was very popular asking for Ben Affleck not to be the next Batman. Uh, I like Ben Affleck. So I don't know. Um, and we get a lot of video game related petitions with people asking for things like having a game work on a certain device or having a character stay in a game who was about to be taken out and so forth. Um, and then we see a lot around you know, technology. So we've seen some pretty interesting uh, petitions around things like Twitter adding, um, you know, blocking or report, better report for abuse on Twitter. We've seen um, Facebook, a victory with Facebook where they allowed pictures of women with mastectomies, which they had previously blocked and now allow, which is um, something people cared passionately about. So there's a, it really runs the gamut, what we see. So I know that uh, change.org had a very different business a couple years ago, and then there was this pivot towards the petition type platform, and I'm curious to learn understand what in, inspired that pivot and also how it affected your revenue. Yeah, so this was before my time. I joined change.org in January of this year uh, as president and COO. Our founder and CEO, Ben Rattray, was leading the company at the time and still does. And he, the site was a blogging network, which many of you may know, and it had a petition element on it, which was really showing promise and success. And so he did what most entrepreneurs don't have the courage to do, which is make a big bet on something that looks like it's working. And he shut down everything else and kept that one part going. And that is when change.org took off like a rocket ship. And he, he saw it working and he made a bet on it and it was the right thing to do. And then we made another big bet last year when we decided to expand internationally. And instead of going to just one country and sort of testing the waters, we went to 18 countries. And all 18 countries worked and are growing. We now have 12 countries with over a million users. And in countries like Spain, where over 13% of the internet population of Spain is using our site. So these kind of big bets, once you know something is working, really going for it is, is a good bet to make. Ah, uh, this is a kind of a follow-up on that in a way. Um, once you sort of found out that that formula did work and it started scaling, uh, one of the things I like about that is that initially, and I remember I'm a 90s internet lover as well, uh, the concept came in pretty soon that people realized, wow, we can reach everyone and so we can get everyone on board with an idea. And I remember the first rounds of uh, petitions that I ever saw, there was sort of a this vague notion of, oh, how quaint that is, but it's just people signing a petition and petitions don't matter. Right. They're not action. Uh, you've proved them wrong and I think that's fantastic, mm, but it still seems to me that they're, to, to scale it to the massive impact and to become the billion dollar company, are you looking into additional ways to enact somebody to go to the next level after they've signed a petition? Yeah. And if you are, uh, are you willing to talk to people such as myself who have ideas and companies <laughs> that are involved in moving people to that next level? We are always interested in talking to people about good ideas. Uh, and yes, we do, as I said before, we view ourselves not as a petition platform, but as an empowerment platform. And so the first step in empowerment is helping people use their voices to take action, and that's what we do. And you're right that we really have proved it wrong. And we say a lot that, like, because people ask us, isn't it too easy to just sign a petition? And they call it slacktivism and so forth. And we say, you know, our job is not to make, is, our job is to make change happen. It's not to make change difficult. So the fact that it's easy and still works is a really good thing. Um, but yes, we certainly see beyond the petition. And so we think about things not only from a perspective of how do you help people use their voices, but eventually, their vote, their dollars, their time, and other things, so. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh